Hi, this is Dr. Tim Henry, and I am the director of the Lindner Cardiovascular Research Center at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Timothy Henry. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Great to be with you. Thank you for being with us. You know, kind of getting started, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how those changed throughout your fellowship? Yeah, really, you know, I, I think, uh, f- so I actually went to UCSF, so I was in the Bay Area. And uh, uh, during that time, um, <clears throat> it became clear that I was more of the internal medicine type. And so I knew I wanted to do internal medicine and then spent a lot of time, like, where do you want to do your residency at? And, uh, you know, I think that's a big question for people to start with uh, when you're in medical school. And um, what I did, I chose the University of Colorado, really smart people, but I like to be, you know, very active outdoors. Um, and so kind of this combination of active, but yet, um, uh, you know, really smart, really excellent program. And then during internal medicine, uh, again, it's, it's a hard decision sometimes. But for me, um, clearly interventional cardiology, cardiology in general, and interventional cardiology was really a developing field. Um, so in fact, when I graduated from medical school, what I do for a living didn't exist. And I think this is true for a lot of people out there. And it's an important thing to remember that fields change. And what you learn in medical school is not the same as what you're going to be doing 20 years from now. So I think that's an important point that it's lifelong learning and you have the ability to change paths on the way. And you can do that. People, everyone does that to an extent. So, um, you know, then I decided I wanted to go into cardiology. Wasn't sure exactly what kind of cardiology, but I think these decisions on uh, where you go for residency and fellowship are really important. And you, and they, they're kind of the same about where you get a job. You know, where do you like to live? What are your family considerations? It is at a high quality program that you're going to get trained to do the things that you want to do. Uh, and so I, it turns out for lots of reasons, went to University of Minnesota because they had a very broad, well-rounded cardiology program, um, good in all different areas, and uh, was designed well for research. So I ended up in Minnesota. So now, okay, taking us through that last year of your fellowship, you know, what was your mentality heading into your first job search? And how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Yeah, it's really good. So what I did during cardiology became clear that I had the mindset and I like to be an interventional cardiologist. Um, and again, it was a rapidly changing field. Angioplasty had really uh, was in its infancy. Stints hadn't been hadn't come out yet. So it was an incredibly exciting time. And you made a difference in people's lives. And, and you know, that uh, has made a difference uh, over my career, because one of the key things I've done is develop systems uh, for treating heart attacks. And so, you know, the the whole field of primary PCI for uh, myocardial infarction, you know, hadn't really even started. You know, we were really just doing it at that time. So it was an exciting time from that standpoint. So it was a career, you know, you took care of sick people, but you made them better. And, and I think this is, you know, you, there are some things um, uh, sort of key things for people to think about. Number one, what do you like to do? You know, what happens is a lot of uh, uh, people get on this track of undergraduate, they go to medical school, they go to residency, and it's like this, uh, you know, uh, escalator that you can't get off. And I, you know, now I'm in the stage of career where I do some, uh, you know, uh, uh, commencement addresses and things like that. And I think it's really worthwhile, uh, uh, some key points. Number one, I always tell people, take time to reflect. Take some time when you're not on that treadmill, get back and say, like, what do I want to do? What's really important to me in life? And then I think so that that's a really important. Another really important one I is remember your roots. Who are you? Where did you come from? And what do you want to do? And that's kind of the same thing of with reflecting. And then the third one I say is always find your passion. Find something you really like to do and that you're good at it. And, and that takes some 
uh, self-reflection because sometimes you want to do something you're not really good at. And, and, you know, it's sort of like, you know, if you play baseball, you know, um, and you are a catcher, you should want to be a catcher, not a shortstop. If you're a shortstop, you should want to be that rather than a first baseman. You know, it's understanding who you are and what your skill sets are. Not always so simple to do. But then once you find your passion, pursue excellence. Do it well. Really do it well. You know, and I think that's a really important thing. Don't cut corners. You know, don't cut corners in your training. Don't cut corners when you take care of people because that will come back to haunt you. And then I think the last thing I tell people is always be humble. Uh, you know, what we do when we take care of people, we're always learning. You know, you're always learning. Tomorrow, you're going to see something you've never seen before, something that's going to surprise you. Uh, you're going to be right and wrong. And uh, hopefully when you're wrong, it's things that it, it's in things that don't matter. So I think those are some really, really key principles to start with. Can you briefly take us through your journey on how you end up at the Christ Hospital and also being the former chief of cardiology at Cedar sinai <laughs> Yeah. So what I did was, uh, so I finished, I knew I wanted to do interventional cardiology. And so, and all those things I just talked to you about, that's planning as much as you can, but then there's also serendipity, right? There's you being in the right place at the right time. And initially I, I actually, Eric Topol was at uh, the university of Michigan. And when I finished my fellowship, i I accepted a job to be, to go to university of Michigan to be a fellow. But that's right when Eric left um, Michigan to go to Cleveland Clinic. And, you know, my wife at the time didn't want anything to do with living in Cleveland. Right. So, uh, you know, that's it's amazing. Right. That totally shaped things. And so then I uh, looked at several different key things, but had the chance to stay in Minneapolis, where right out of my fellowship, I became the cath lab director and interventional cardiac director at Hennepin County, which was part of the University of Minnesota system, sort of the county hospital. And, you know, what that did is allowed me to grow program, allowed me to grow a research program. Uh, I developed, had research mentors that were, you know, uh, uh, as part of the Timmy group. So, you know, Eugene Brownweld and lots of really good people. And it, that was uh, incredibly successful. And so you, you know, you need to stay someplace long enough to develop it and watch and grow and, and find those things. You know, I think another key principle is to look around you and, and find opportunity. Look where there are unmet needs. And then that represents an opportunity for you to fix it. Right. You've done that yourself, actually. And 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 so um, that it really uh, presented itself. And we grew a very uh, wonderful research unit that was extremely successful. So I was there for about 10 or 11 years. And then you got to a place where it was plateaued. You know, I had sort of done what I could do there. And now was the opportunity to say, what, what should I do next? And so again, I looked around at a few different places and um, uh, partly again, time, I had three kids. Kids are really important for me. I, I just, I think balance in your life is important. You know, I coached my kids in baseball and basketball, uh, you know, and those were, those are very important things, right? I'm still close to my kids now because I spent the time to do that. Um, <clears throat> so I did, it would have been hard to move cities. And then there came a great job, uh, the Minneapolis Heart Institute to be director of research. So then I moved in a job where I had, 50% clinical, where I was in the CAF lab, and then 50% um, doing research. And again, a very successful, we were able to grow it, um, had one of the largest networks for treating heart attacks in the United States, one of the largest networks for treating refractory engine in the world, lots of novel uh, research opportunities there. And then then it, that went for about 12 or 13 years. And again, you got to the point where I loved my job. I had a perfect job. But now my kids graduated from high school and, you know, I had to say, if I kept doing that, it was going to be the same. 
And for me, it, it was the opportunity to interview for the job to be chief of cardiology at Cedars came up. And, you know, very unique opportunity. Cedars is a very unique institution, chance to live in Los Angeles. I, you know, and I liked Los Angeles, but I, you know, grew to love Los Angeles. And so, you know, it's a terrific opportunity. Uh, and for five years and, um, you know, uh, working with fellows, again, doing part clinical, part research, and it was terrific. And so all of those things were steps along the, uh, along the way that are kind of that part of, and, you know, and let me just tell you, I think everybody that's out there, um, these are some difficult decisions. And, and whenever you come to these kind of forks in the road, you have to sit back and take the principles that I talked about earlier, you know, remember your roots, take time to reflect, really understand who you are and what you want to get, what you want to do and what you accomplish. And, um, and so then uh, I was five years there, but again, then it comes to the end of your time. Do you stay or do you, um, I, and now it's a different time in my life, right? My two youngest kids just got married. And so they're in the Midwest. And so for me to be back in the Midwest, closer to my kids and, and grandkids is something that I think is, um, you know, a different thing. And th this is an incredibly good group. So the Lindner Center is one of the largest clinical research centers in the United States. And uh, Dean Kariakis, um, who has been a friend of mine forever, uh, was the former director. And, and we basically worked uh, together. And, it, and we have a great group of young faculty that, you know, again, it's allowed to mentor them. So it's, you know, it's a unique opportunity. And I think that's what people should do. Keep challenging yourself. Find that way. You know, uh, keep a good balance between your home life and your work life. But make sure, you know, listen, you spend a lot of time going through medical school, residency, fellowship. You know, you want to make sure that you're in a job where you love what you do every day. Now, what would you say were some of the keys of your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the ranks in the academic world? Yeah. So I think one of those things are is, um, and I think for clinical research, uh, no one really teaches you how to do it very much. You just have to figure it out. Um, and so we've actually tried to do that. We have uh, uh, developed uh, summer student programs and really good mentoring programs for undergraduates, for medical students, for residents, and for fellows. And I, I think that's very gratifying because you're able to do a lot of what we're doing now, um, you know, it, every day. Um, and I think uh, what it was is, uh, recognizing opportunities or unmet needs, and then spending time to uh, develop, uh, you know, strategies to fix those problems. And so, you know, the uh, when I went to uh, uh, Minneapolis Heart in 2002, um, primary PCI was just coming or doing it in PCI hospitals. But there was evidence that if you transferred people from small hospitals that didn't have cath labs, that they would do better. And, you know, we did it. We were the first place to really do it. And we sub subsequently had like 35 hospitals all around Minnesota that would send us their heart attacks. And then we kept track of the data. And so, you know, um, there's this is too long to go through all of this, but uh, it, you know, I think recognizing unmet needs and opportunities, going after it to solve those problems to make clinical care better. So if you're gonna do clinical research, you're doing education, I think clinical care, education and research go together. And I think we're incomplete if we're not doing all three. Now, it may be your job is more clinical, or it may be more teaching, or it may be more research, but understanding all three and how they go to better. I mean, you can't do state-of-the-art interventional cardiology without doing state-of-the-art cardiology research. Imagine, you know, taking care of aortic stenosis, but not putting in the new TAVR valve, right? You, you know, you wouldn't do it or treating heart failure without doing the best of available treatments. And then teaching is a critically important part of what we do. And again, the training, like we talked about with undergraduates and medical students, residents, fellows, but then also with your peers, you know, and I've been blessed to be able to go all, all around the United States and all around the world, actually. Uh, and that's fun. 
people you people stimulate you, you learn from each other. Uh, and uh, so I, I've been lucky. Now, the pandemic happened, you know, in 2020 and still kind of going on now in 2021. And a lot of the, you know, next year's graduating class and this year's graduating classes dealt with some different unique situations. So what yeah. advice do you give them as far as our networking and outreaching process in a virtual world? Yeah. So two things about that, I'll tell you. Number one, it's another opportunity. It's another example of recognizing opportunity because very early in the pandemic, we saw that there was a decrease in uh, STEMI activations, right? So we actually, we had March data and we had that published in Jack in the first two, few days of April, right? And so that was a really important thing. Second of all, we put together a registry of COVID positive patients who have SCL elevation, which is now the largest registry in the world. So it fits in that recognize I who would have thought that a year later that I would be you know have 15 COVID publications not what I thought I was going to do but what during that time you know I'm going to be president of Society of Coronary Angiography and Intervention next year and part of doing that is we really felt sky stepped up to take care of patient cardiolo- cardiovascular patients and interventional cardiologists, and that includes the fellows. So we did surveys of interventional fellows, and I'll, um, the best example I'll tell you with that is it, there was no question it disruptive because early on in March and April, the volumes were down. So lots of uh, fellows may not have gotten their total number of procedures, et cetera. People had signed contracts for jobs that then you know, fell through. Um, and I think it's all getting back to normal. And I think another thing we worked really hard at was getting back to normal. So we recognized that patients were afraid to come to the hospital. In fact, we just finished a survey last week, still now a year later, um, we found that uh, about 50% of patients are reluctant to go into their appointments or to get procedures done. And that's more common it, with uh, minorities. So blacks and Hispanics, almost 75% are reluctant to go in and get a procedure that they need, You know, it's, it, which tells you what's happening out there. And so it's our job to really let them know the hospital's safe. You can come to the hospital. We'll take good care of you. And not getting those procedures is detrimental to your health. So, you know, I think um, uh, what I would say about people is uh, stick to it. State of the principles. Who are you? What do you want to do? Um, and, and spend time really reflecting on that where a job. And sometimes it requires a little flexibility. You know, when I finished my uh, uh, fellowship, I, I wanted to live in Denver. I love Denver. Now, I looked in Denver three times at jobs, but it just would never have been that what I was able to do in Minneapolis um, was uh, from many different standpoints, from a financial standpoint, from a job opportunity standpoint, I would not have had those opportunities in Denver. So be able to look at that, too, and say, you know, it may be that what some region is where you need to live because your parents are older or, you know, because of your spouse or, or whatever, but be some flexibility with that. If you have the chance, because sometimes, um, you know, being a little flexible might put you in a position where your career can grow faster. Here's what I tell you. It's, it's a wonderful career. It's a great thing to do. You know, I wake up every day and I love going to work. And uh, so, you know, good luck to all of you. Hopefully this is helpful. And if I cross paths with you, I'm always happy to talk to you and give you more insights. But thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.